vulnerabilities in automotive systems. That's a broad range and there's plenty of stuff to talk about for hours and hours. Um, brief introduction of myself, I work for Bosch, Bosch Engineering in particular. Uh, Bosch is one of the largest car supplier manufacturers, so uh, if you take a random car, chances are high that some component is manufactured by uh, Bosch. And Bosch Engineering is specifically specialized in adapting those parts uh, for small, serious customers, which is very exciting because I have exciting customers and also ex all the product range of Bosch is at our disposal, more or less. Um, at night, um, I love online privacy, so we are uh, hosting tour relays in Vienna. Um, I didn't mention it, we're based in Vienna, Austria. Um, and in between, I do digital forensics. Uh, yeah. And the meme artist is on the slide, so these pictures that you're about to see are memes, and they are not uh, subtle copyright infringements, but pieces of art. And there's my Twitter handle. So the goal of this talk for me is to give a broad introduction into automotive security, um, more or less a path that I've been walking the past five years. Uh, my background is in IT and security. I didn't know much about uh, automotive security. Um, of course, uh, you, I saw the headlines. And since I'm working now in this field for a few years, I thought it might be interesting to have this one introductory talk to everybody uh, who is interested in this topic. Um, the goal is to identify the most relevant hacks, attacks, and vulnerabilities that have been out there. Um, of course, your mileage may vary, so uh, there are numerous sources out there. Just go wander on the internet to figure out what automotive hacking is all about, um, and also to uh, give you your own journey to automotive security. Yeah, objectives, um, real-world attacks that have been demonstrated, not theoretical attacks. Uh, what to expect? Uh, I'll only talk about public stuff, so everything that is found online uh, is linked. Um, I also put the slides online. You can find them on my Twitter. Uh, and uh, every picture is usually linked to the source document, so you can walk from the slides and read on the details of all the different uh, attacks. And uh, yeah, basically, what I observed, there are two groups that do automotive hacking. Uh, one is the hackers for the fame, and the other group is companies for the fame and some fortune. So uh, the ecosystem of companies that focus on automotive security is growing and growing. Um, and most of the time, it starts by some hacker fiddling with their car and trying to get things to work that weren't supposed to work or have it uh, the other way around. What I didn't include in this talk is uh, the automotive basics. So there are numerous talks and resources online. Check out the Car Hacking Village. Check out uh, the Open Garage book about what a CAM bus is, how uh, architectures of components work in cars. I also didn't include APIs, because this is just regular IT security. Securing an API for a car shouldn't be different than securing an API for Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is. Um, I also didn't include immobilizer things, uh, also uh, locking systems, because uh, there has been tremendous research going on on the Megamos crypto system or high tech too, how to basically you're able to steal a car because the security is not done properly in the immobilizer. This is not covered here, so I'm focusing on every other component than uh, the locking system and the uh, immobilizers because uh, regulation demands that every car has a mobilizer and usually this is done with some cryptographic handshake uh, with the key or with a phone or uh, whatever it is. So let's start the journey. Um, the first time um, or the first nice resource I found about uh, automotive hacking was a paper from 2010. Uh, it was published at uh, an academic security conference in 2010. And basically what the researchers did is was to analyze how the car works in the 
inner workings to figure out what a CAM bus is, how you can uh, replay, relay, or inject specific CAM frames to get basic functionality um, just by hooking onto the communication bus. So the CAM bus is a very simple communication bus. It provides real-time communication with arbitration, which is a great thing uh, if you would like to have priorities and messages. So unlocking the car probably has a lower priority compared to detonate the airbag. So um, this is very useful for uh, most situations. And uh, what they identified was that these frames, they are not protected. They are not encrypted or authenticated. So getting your uh, debugger or your component connected to one of these buses allowed to do all kind of things that are supposed to be regular functions by the car. Um, it's rather easy to do that, so you can just hook up an OBD port or any CAN shield for a Raspberry Pi, uh, and you can work from there to basically just sniff messages and then inject them again and see, see what happens. Uh, what they were able to demonstrate is that you could kill the engine, you could apply the brakes, and you could disable the brakes just by sitting on the bus, which is kind of the, the goal of all the hackers and attackers, to basically have some functionality engaged, like applying the brakes or steering, uh, which can do physical harm, because this is not supposed to happen, and this shouldn't happen at all costs. Uh, you can also see uh, down here, uh, this paper was cited 2,000 times since uh, 2010. Uh, so uh, going from there through the work of academics is very interesting because you can see the popular works that have been cited many times often um, again and again. And in the picture to the right, you can see that they uh, pwned the instrument cluster display. Uh, so in the vehicle, the text that is shown there is sent over some bus, uh, and they were able to manipulate it and include their own uh, message by fiddling with the communication content. Um, so as I said, what they identified was mostly intended functionality. So the threat model at that time was that if the car is locked, um, it is considered in a secure state. Of course, you can attach yourself to those vehicular buses, but uh, at the same time, you can also cut the brake lines or uh, tamper with other sensors if you are physically. So basically, that was the first work to um, show that the regular functionality could also be abused for malicious functionality, um, but mostly because that was beyond the threat model back at the time. Uh, in the follow-up paper, and that was really cool, um, they showed how to hack a telematics unit in one of, uh, one of their cars. Uh, they published it at Usenix Security, and what was really cool uh, in that talk was that they were able to make that car join an IRC channel for command and control messages. So basically, 2011 botnets were a thing, as they are now, but they used IRC. Uh, so they connected some component from the car over the telematics unit with the internet IRC server, and then were able to submit commands to the car. They demonstrated that they could do location tracking, so issuing IRC commands, hey, what's your location? Uh, they were able to exfiltrate audio, uh, so the car had a microphone. Uh, they could activate it remotely and get that uh, audio uh, exfiltrated. Um, what they also demonstrated was that uh, the update functionality of the infotainment system uh, was unsigned. So every time someone in the dealer or in the workshop, they updated the software of the infotainment system with the CD player and thing. Um, they did this with an unsigned binary. So basically just tampering with the binary, you could root your uh, CD player without actually uh, having to bypass any security measure. Uh, they also found, a, and this is really cool, a buffer overflow in the WMA parser, and they were able to exploit this over the telematics unit via a phone call. So basically what they did is they called the telematics unit because it had a SIM card, it had a phone number. Um, it wasn't shown to the user that someone is calling the telematics unit because 
no one would ever do that. Um, and then they were able to exploit the buffer overflow in the WMA parser to get uh, root privileges on the telematics unit, which is really cool, really uh, the holy grail of automotive hacking, because uh, with that amount of control remotely, you can do all kind of nasty things. And you can see it in the picture. It's one of the first iPhones or uh, whatever it is. They're holding a speaker to the uh, microphone and exploiting the car just like this. Um, I've never seen anything like this again. It's really, really cool. All right. Moving forward, 2013, uh, two students, uh, Dutch students, I think, yeah, University of Amsterdam, uh, what they analyzed was a BMW, and they analyzed the uh, telematics unit as well. Uh, how they did it was they wrapped the antenna of the telematics unit in tinfoil and put an IMSI catcher or USRP or some kind of uh, base station fakery next to it, uh, and then they were able to inspect and modify uh, SMS content that was sent back and forth. Uh, they saw that uh, by just by intercepting the messages, it works like that. Uh, if there is a command waiting for the car in the back end, the car receives an SMS. The SMS triggers wake up of uh, the relevant components once they are online. The car connects to the back end, asks if there are commands, and then downloads these commands and executes them. Um, however, what they saw was that uh, it used an HTTP proxy, it used their own APN, their own private online network, more or less. Um, but uh, there was no authentication per se, so it was a base 64 encoded uh, authentication, which is basically no authentication. And uh, they were able to basically simulate the backend and issue commands to the vehicle just uh, like a regular backend would do for functionality, which is part of uh, the car. What's also interesting, uh, maybe that was replaced by the proxy, um, but in one request they mentioned that the user agent of the car uh, was Firefox 3.5 on Windows 7, which doesn't add up. Uh, maybe they saw their own user agent string, but it's really uh, interesting to see that a car uh, identifies as a Firefox. Whether it's legit uh, or not, I don't know, but uh, I found it very funny. Two years later, uh, the German ADAC, uh, they took up the work of them, or they replicated the work with the IMSI catcher, and because it's the German ADAC, Germans love their cars, so it's a quite powerful institution. Um, they redid uh, this kind of attack, so again, they had a fake base station catching the car, um, and uh, back in 2013, uh, there was a fleet key, uh, there was a key added to SMSs for commands that added encryption and uh, authentication of some kind. However, there was one key for all the cars of the same kind, so it was kind of a fleet key, which is not a good thing if you do it. Um, they then published that for unlocking the car, uh, the car sends, an, uh, the backend sends an HTTP GET uh, request, unencrypted, unauthenticated. Uh, so you have the wake up SMS, which is authenticated of some kind using encryption, um, which shares the key. And uh, yeah, basically, uh, what they showed was that if you see a car, uh, you have to read the VIN, which is conveniently stored next to the windshield. Um, you can catch the telematics unit, uh, you can wake, have it wake up, connect to your fake base station, and unlock 2.2 million cars. Um, yeah, that was kind of not good. Uh, they also showed XML configs have been unauthenticated, so the car could be updated for new features or seeded heats for end, whatever it is. Um, and that was an unauthenticated XML file. And uh, by manipulating that on the fly, you could unlock uh, additional features. In the same year, uh, there was also GM with their OnStar system. So if you remember in 2011, uh, there was this remote telematics head unit that uh, had been hacked over 
calling it. Uh, until 2015, uh, GM didn't have a fix, and they didn't, or maybe they had one and they applied it in uh, the workshops, but for cars that never made it into the workshop, um, they had to hack their car themselves, more or less, to update the software. So the OnStar system, the telematics system, they was never built at the time for uh, software updates. Um, they exploited it to introduce update functionality and updated uh, two million, about two million cars to basically uh, get the fixed software by uh, basically hacking it, which is kind of neat if you hack your own product to have additional functionality uh, that wasn't designed in the first place. 2015 was also the year, the year of uh, Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek, the famous Jeep hack, which has been uh, through the media again and again. Uh, so for every training I give it uh, within our company, um, this is a must-see, of course, uh, because uh, that changed the, the entire industry to some kind that it's not a good idea to just add more SIM cards, but you probably would like to have firewalls and uh, regular IT security features uh, could be useful. Uh, they demonstrated it with the famous uh, video where uh, Andy Greenberg was driving on the highway. Uh, they connected remotely to the car and uh, activated the radio, the windshield wipers, and uh, then shut off the engine. Uh, very powerful uh, video and very powerful marketing, of course, for enhancing security in vehicles. How did they do it? In their 2015 paper, uh, they identified there was a Uconnect unit, it was running QNX, uh, kind of a real-time uh, embedded uh, system. Uh, this connectivity unit had a 3G connection uh, to the backend, and uh, it had open ports locally over Wi-Fi, so if you connected with your car over Wi-Fi, uh, you could see the open ports of the telematics unit. Um, they also saw that uh, you could do software updates over USB for jailbreaking it. So again, software updates were not signed. You had to plug in the proper file name and the proper uh, software, some basic functionality like uh, some checksums to identify that uh, it's a legit, legit uh, software update. And uh, just by manipulating the software, they could change the software. But of course, um, it's not straightforward. You cannot dis disassemble it right away and take some pain to modify the software. But what they then found, and this is the, the big thing, is uh, they found that each car has two IP addresses. One of them is for the in-vehicular services. So if the car spawns a hotspot, um, it connects to a proxy, and that is the external IP then. Um, but they also saw that the telematics unit had a self-announced uh, IP address, more or less. So everything in the car was using the uh, proper connection, uh, but uh, there was also the regular IP address that wasn't firewalled. Uh, they had to scan two net ranges uh, of um, sufficient size uh, and could connect to it because the telematics unit did not expose the open ports only locally, uh, but also on the internet interface, which is not a good thing, and the, the video clearly demonstrates that. 2000, 2015 was also a great presentation uh, at DEF CON, uh, where uh, two guys hacked their Tesla. Uh, they identified that, of course, it's a local Linux. Of course, it connects to some kind of uh, backend called Mothership uh, using a VPN. Uh, but by local manipulation, they were able to SSH into their car, um, and they could do all kind of uh, nasty things using this SSH connection, so uh, they could turn off the car or open the doors, uh, basically everything that is regular functionality or functionality over the app, uh, they were able to demonstrate that as well. Again, you had to have local access, but uh, if you put your car in the dealership, uh, you could basically backdoor every car again and again that is coming in, uh, and then at a later point in time, go harvest all the belongings in the car or take the cars themselves. One, uh, once physical access is enough to pertain physical access uh, for the future. 
And again, uh, they showed all the different architectures. Um, every car is different in the architecture and the used components. So uh, one of the first thing most people do is to figure out, okay, which components are in there, what communication buses they use, and how could this potentially be exploited. Another work from 2015, also very interesting, uh, they demonstrated in an academic publication uh, that aftermarket OBD dongles, things that you plug into your OBD port to have diagnostics or uh, I don't know, status messages, things that you do with uh, your car insurances sometimes do that. Um, they identified a popular brand and uh, dissected it uh, and found that they have the same SSH key pair on all the OBD toggles, and they were sold in the thousands. Not a good thing to have the same SSH key because once you compromise one of these uh, dongles, you could compromise every other. And uh, yeah, basically they also demonstrated it on Shodan, 2,000 devices um, by remotely applying the brakes. So they wrote an app, they connected to the vehicle, uh, to the OBD port in question. This could be done over the internet and then they were able to inject brake messages to basically bring the car to a halt, which is again endangering physical safety, which is not a good thing. 2016, Miller and Valasek striked again. Uh, they showed more advanced analysis of uh, their cheap hack. Um, and what they were able to demonstrate, which didn't quite work uh, in 2015, was some sophisticated techniques to uh, basically denial of service specific component. So basically what they um, observed was that uh, if you put an ECU, some component, into boot mode, into boot ROM mode, they wait for a software update and they will never wake up again uh, until the software or the car is uh, restarted or the software is applied. Um, also, cars cannot handle conflicting messages. So if the message doesn't have a counter or a cryptographic authentication tag with them, uh, you could simply inject a contradicting message and the car wouldn't know which message uh, is the valid one. Uh, some messages had counters and they could, because they only increment, the counters nothing magically, um, they could predate the counters and send the message before the next legit message and thus um, prevent the legit message from arriving. And uh, yeah, what they also demonstrated in somewhere where there were plenty of cornfields was that they were able to um, engage the brakes and uh, steer using the parking assistant. So this is kind of the most physically attack that could be possible uh, if you're driving on the autobahn uh, and all of a sudden your steering wheel turns to some angle, it's definitely going to be resulting in a crash. 2016 was also the year of uh, Keen Labs. They demonstrated in a blog post first how they were able to get uh, root access on a Tesla. Uh, they did this by uh, exploiting the fact that Teslas always connect to a known Wi-Fi, which is, you can find it online. Uh, so if you drive up to a supercharger, your car will connect uh, to this Wi-Fi and will ask for software updates and things like that. Um, they were able to trigger a WebKit exploit, so the, sh the, the screen in the middle had a browser, that browser was not pa fully patched, and uh, by redirecting and intercepting uh, the browser communication, uh, they were able to exploit the browser, and because the kernel had been outdated, they were able to uh, elevate their privileges to root access to basically do anything over the networks uh, because they uh, got root. Uh, they also presented this at Black Hat in 2017. Um, and basically, I'm not sure if you can see it on, on the right, but that's the infamous Christmas show video where they had two cars dancing more or less and blinking with uh, s specific patterns to, um, and they did this by uh, this exploit chain. Uh, they also said that, okay, there's uh, the, the Software update for the gateways module isn't un is not signed. Um, after the publication, everything has been signed. Um, and also Tesla pushed the kernel from 
2.6-ish to 4.4-ish. Um, so basically, based on these public hacks, the software security tremendously increased compared to uh, the previous Tesla hack. Uh, in 2018, uh, Keen Labs did it again. Uh, they presented their findings on uh, the Tesla X. And uh, because the kernel has been locked down and updated, no known vulnerabilities, um, they had to find another way into the kernel. And this time, they did it with uh, the kernel module for the NVIDIA Tegra chip, uh, which is part of, uh, if you want to use your uh, not sure which component it is, but if it has an NVIDIA Tegra chip that is run in the kernel, and there was a bug in there, in there to elevate privileges. Um, they also identified that, uh, and that's cool, uh, if you prepend the signature with some spaces, there's a confusion, and uh, the car rendered the software update as legit, even though you just had to add one or two spaces before the signature uh, to ha bypass that signature check. And they also talked about details on the Tesla uh, XMAS show. In 2018, there was also the uh, Leonard Wooters Tesla hack. Um, I know I promised in the beginning it's not about locking, but uh, this is kind of locking because it's really cool. Um, what Leonard Wooters was able to demonstrate is that you have to get two challenges from the car. So every time you pull the handle, uh, the car sends out over, um, not sure which frequency, a challenge. And if the key fob or uh, any other uh, device used for authentication is able to answer that challenge, the car unlocks. <laughs> and he was able to uh, bypass that by just using two challenges from the car and collecting one response from the key fob, built a rainbow table of five terabytes, and uh, basically was able to unlock every Tesla because they all had the same um, locking system. Uh, the locking system itself was from an external supplier, so even though this is the famous Tesla hack, uh, it also infected numerous other cars that had the same uh, locking system implemented. Um, it used some proprietary crypto DST40, and uh, you can see on the right the uh, wake-up signal uh, arrives at the key fob, uh, the key fob replies, then the car sends a 40-bit challenge, and the key fob responds with a 24-bit response. 24-bit isn't that much for 2018, and that's why he was able to enumerate all the challenges and all uh, the responses. In 2019, Tesla participated in the Pwn to Own contest. Uh, so Basically, uh, if you can compromise a thing, uh, you can keep it. Um, you have to just publicly disclose the uh, way and the vulnerability that you abused. Um, they, uh, the Fluoroacetat team, uh, they demonstrated a JIT bug in the browser and uh, successfully exploited uh, the infotainment, and uh, they won 35,000K. Again, browser vulnerability, uh, most of the time, if it has a browser or if it has a Linux kernel, if it's not running on the latest version, uh, chances are high that there's something hidden in there. In 2019, Keen Labs also published or discussed at Black Hat their uh, research on BMW. Uh, they more or less uh, identified 14 CVEs. Some of them were remotely triggerable and uh, demonstrated how they did it and uh, what they did. Um, they compromised the head unit. You can see the picture in the middle. They had their own logo displayed. Um, they also demonstrated to compromise the gateway and also the telematics unit. This is from the slides themselves. Uh, so basically, this is for many modern cars um, applicable. You have an OBD2 port, uh, which goes to a switch or straight to a gateway. Uh, and then you have somewhere, you have the telematics, you have the head unit, and then you have the bus-based systems like uh, controlling the engine, controlling the doors, windows, uh, headlights, whatever it is. Also controlling things like advanced sensory, like you have front radar, you have LiDAR, you have video, all different kind of uh, sensors are now in a car used. 
In 2020, a different group from China, SkyGo360 group, published their research on a Daimler E-Class, I think it was. Um, they demonstrated at great length uh, the different attack vectors uh, that they tried. And what I like particularly about this is that they also described what they tried and what failed. So it reads like an introductory to automotive security. Um, next, we tried this, didn't work next, next, and all the different steps that they uh, take to compromise the system is outlined in a wonderful report. Um, they didn't succeed at Windows CE7, so apparently if you buy a Daimler for I don't know how many thousand euros, uh, the head unit comes with Windows CE7, which is kind of uh, weird, at least to me. Um, they, they failed at that component, but they uh, tried and succeeded at the telematics unit, uh, which is running Linux on some ARM, uh, they were able to impersonate the car and connect to the back end. Uh, what's also really great about this uh, presentation is that they used all the big tools that money can buy. Uh, so they soldered off the NAND flash from one of the components um, and basically rewired it to get access to the content stored in the um, they used an X-ray for finding the JTAG ports because they were hidden somewhere in between the layers. And they also re-implanted uh, this NAND chip uh, for impl implanting a backdoor. So basically, they took the component out of the car, they took the chip off the PCB, they rewrote it with different software and then re it to the component and put everything back together. It must have been a tremendous amount of work that went into that, um, and it's really hard to defend against such powerful and capable uh, attackers. Of course, you could encrypt the content, but then you can still, yeah. It's more or less uh, very interesting because of the tools they used. Early 2021, there was a tweet by some EA foundation, uh, and that was particularly interesting because uh, that was not a talk, that was not presentation at some security conference, it wasn't a vendor, it was just a hacker trying to get additional features for their infotainment system. And uh, basically with that tweet, uh, he or she described at great length what steps they took to um, get code execution rights on the kind of not so modern uh, infotainment system. You can see in the picture it runs a 2.6 kernel. Uh, it's a Nissan and it's uh, surprisingly it's a Bosch component. So um, it's a rather old uh, Bosch infotainment system that is not sold anymore. Um, but of course it's still driving around uh, in the thousands. Um, in this post, uh, he or she described uh, first how to dismantle the infotainment system, find the serial ports and attach to them, and uh, using uh, the U-boot bootloader, um, he or she were able to get read-write access to the file system and modify uh, or at least read the entire file system that is on there. Um, the surprising twist in this publication then was that by reading the source code and reading all uh, the, the binaries and things like that, uh, he found that script, which is uh, shown here below, uh, that script assigns a unique name for a USB drive that you plug in. So you have an MP3 collection, you don't trust Spotify, so uh, you use plain old uh, USB thumb drives, uh, you plug it in, and uh, this USB drive is then assigned a mount point. And uh, if it has a UUID, this USB thumb drive, it will get that UUID in assigned as a mount point. But if it has a label, like a name or things like that, uh, the mount point will be created using that label. And the really interesting part is, by having a label that has semicolon, dash, dash, uh, some functionality or some command, you can get command execution simply by renaming your USB thumb drive to a specific name. And it's genius because it's so simple. You, once you have this vulnerability, you need to just plug in a specific USB thumb drive, wait five minutes or five seconds, uh, and you have root and can activate Wi-Fi, SSH, whatever it is. Brilliant hack. 
And of course, it's also very easy to, to uh, defend against because basically you just need to uh, change that line to not include semicolons or uh, every thing that is not a character um, to defend against that. Another work from Leonard Wooters was, uh, again, a Tesla hack, but uh, this time uh, the Tesla X. Uh, what he demonstrated was that the, and you can see it in the brilliant presentation at uh, DEF CON 29 car hacking village from last year. And um, the key fob itself is a combination of uh, different chips. Uh, so you have a Bluetooth component in there, you have a microcontroller in there, and you have a secure element. And uh, what he demonstrated was that with this self-built machine, uh, he is able to wake up the Bluetooth chip of uh, the key fob, uh, then update the software over Bluetooth, uh, which is a usual process. And uh, once the software is uploaded, uh, it is checked against uh, signature with the secure element. Uh, but the vulnerability here is that this uh, response from the secure element was ignored. So regardless of the secure element saying, yes, this is a legit signature, or no, do not apply this software, it's not legit, um, it applied the software update and installed the malicious software. Uh, yeah, with that, he was able to extract unlock tokens for, for all the doors, and uh, everything wireless, you can see it in a brilliant video demonstration. Um, you just need to be within range of the key fob to basically do all the necessary steps for this attack. Uh, with those stolen tokens, he then approaches the car, mimics a key fob, and uh, sends the tokens to unlock uh, the doors. Uh, once he's inside the car, he attaches to the body controller. Uh, there's no authentication involved, which is surprising. Um, but then he could train a new key fob. So he bought a used key fob on eBay. Um, once he's connected to the, um, to the car, uh, he's able to say, hey, I have a new key fob, it's this, and drive away with his new car. Another Tesla hack, uh, Weinmann and Schmotzler, uh, they demonstrated at Kensec West how to use uh, uh, overflow buffer, uh, stack overflow over Wi-Fi uh, to get root permissions on uh, the component in question. Um, they showed it in a video, you can't see it here, but there's a drone, and basically the attack is exploitable using this drone, because you, all you have to do is send some Wi-Fi packets and uh, connect. And uh, what they were using is Conman, it's uh, the connection manager of Yocto Linux, and uh, that had a stack overflow to uh, get root privileges. 2021, Keen Labs again. So I didn't know it, but Keen Labs had a run on Black Hat talks and demonstrations for consecutive years uh, again and again. Um, they analyzed the Daimler MBOUX head unit system, uh, and uh, they were able to, again, compromise uh, everything using a proprietary protocol that is spoken. Uh, so the attack goes that upon starting, uh, the head unit and the telematics unit, uh, they exchange a WPA encrypted key over the bus. This is unencrypted, so it can be sniffed. Uh, they can then connect with this Wi-Fi and then uh, do nasty things. And one of the things uh, that was provided by uh, the head unit was uh, the proprietary high net protocol. I've never heard it before, I don't know what it is. Um, but it included buffer overflows, so basically uh, from there it's fair game to um, basically just uh, compromise everything. Yeah. In 2021, also uh, at Black Hat, uh, Colin of Lynn uh, demonstrated that glitching ECUs is useful to bypass protections. Uh, so usually nowadays you have a ECU um, that is protected, so you have a JTAG password, you have a UART password, and by glitching these password uh, checks, uh, you can get access to the component without needing to know uh, the password. He demonstrated in uh, Corvette, and uh, the, the microcontroller in question was an NXP microcontroller with power architecture, uh, which still is commonly used uh, for automotive, even though everything is moving towards ARM nowadays. 
early 2020s, so 2022, so we're reaching uh, the end of the timeline. Um, Willem Melching, he's working for uh, Comma AI. He dismantled the steering ECU from his uh, Golf. Um, it's from 2008, it's r rather old, um, but uh, what it demonstrates nicely that uh, it's not only about the engine controller for tuning or the body controller for locking. Um, you can also control the steering module simply by manipulating the software on it. Uh, Comma AI, the company he's working for, is doing a business with that, uh, so they hijack the steering and use the um, I think it's a stereo optical system to basically steer the car on the highway. Yeah, very powerful write-up because again, it shows uh, again and again how uh, you analyze such an automotive embedded component. At Pwn to Own in May, uh, Synactiv demonstrated again a Tesla exploit. Uh, they used Wi-Fi. There's no write-up yet, um, but they will talk about it at Hexacon in, 2020, uh, in, in October in Paris, uh, how they did it. I'm really looking forward to that. I really hope it's uh, getting recorded. Argus, the company, uh, demonstrated at Black Hat Asia and this is really some high-level exploitation, uh, that they could exploit using a buffer overflow an embedded automotive component. So usually the components, they don't have Linux, they don't have QNX. The smaller components have their own software stack specifically for automotive, usually Autosar or something like that. Um, and they demonstrated that they could use a buffer overflow in processing of those CAN messages uh, to get code execution on that embedded component. Really powerful. Um, this is going to keep me for the next one or year, two years busy, not only to understand how it works, but also how to derive countermeasures. Uh, head tip to Niels, who showed me that. That's really, really powerful attack. Uh, Martin Herfurt, he's somewhere here. He's going to present tomorrow on uh, his Tesla hacks. He demonstrated at Cansec West a uh, Bluetooth relay attack against uh, Tesla 3. Uh, so basically, with a Tesla 3, you have your key in your uh, smartphone, and over Bluetooth, they exchange the cryptographic uh, dance for authentication. Uh, and what he showed was that you can do this wirelessly over the internet. So he built two Raspberry Pis um, with Bluetooth interfaces, and one is next to the key fob, the other one is next to the car, uh, which basically allows anywhere uh, to unlock the car. Uh, there have been two other groups about the same time that showed this. One is an academic publication. They did it with uh, a wired connection. Uh, and uh, Sultan from NCC Group, he showed this uh, two days prior. Um, so basically, Bluetooth relay attack works. And uh, he will present uh, tomorrow about his uh, wonderful vulnerability that he identified. Um, basically, there was in, uh, if you unlock your Tesla with an NFC card, it unlocked a window of 130 seconds where uh, you do not need to re-authenticate, for example, to re-tap the card to start the engine. Uh, but what he identified was that uh, there's uh, no user notification of any kind, you can also pair a new Bluetooth key and uh, thus have a new car key as a mobile phone paired with that vehicle. Um, I've seen somewhere on Twitter, Kevin2600, he tweeted that there's a software update now available. Um, I didn't verify it. Um, if you're interested in that, go to his talk uh, tomorrow. Um, it's a close proximity attack and you need to have someone tapping with the NFC card uh, for uh, entering the vehicle, uh, but once uh, you see this, you can pair a key and you have a new Tesla. Really, really impressive. Yeah, that's about it. Um, this was the really rushed timeline of automotive hacks that I find uh, fascinating. Uh, usual disclaimer, do not hack cars. You might hurt yourself or others. You should know what you are doing. Um, and if you would like to be informed, Twitter, of course, has plenty of resources. There's the ASRG, uh, the Automotive Security Research Group. They are hosting an online uh, event, I think it's in September, it's called Secure Our Streets, and it's will, it will be an online conference dedicated to uh, automotive 
security. Um, and there's the car hacking village, of course. DEF CON is around the corner, and I'm really excited for uh, the things that are going to be published there. Uh, with that, thank you very much, and happy to answer questions. Martin, thank you very much. That was an excellent, concise overview of everything that happened in the last few years in car hacking. And I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to see everything just going on yeah. and, and, and people working on the security of that. Uh, having said that, any questions? Could you come to the middle and talk close to the mic? There's a microphone here next to the pole. Stand closely to the microphone and use test, that one. Test, yes. Um, I'm not quite sure how long it's been, but I remember there was a Chinese group um, hacking a Tesla rain sensor camera with mm -hmm. uh, a general adversarial network attack. Yeah. Wasn't in the hacks, so was yeah. that like uh, too boring or what's, I mean, okay, there was no access. Mm. Like. <laughs> mm, good question. Um, the, what they managed is to confuse the uh, recognizer for street and uh, things like a stop sign. Um, I didn't include it because uh, it's really modern and I wanted to, of course, if you build such a system, it should be obvious that you could trick it to some extent, um, but I didn't include it for uh, time constraints. Yeah, okay, cool. Because I think like the visual attack vectors, yeah. they will be a big role. And as you said also, yeah. nobody's securing stuff on the lower level, so yeah. yeah. Okay. Absolutely, and all those camera-based systems, they are connected using Ethernet because CAM bus is way too slow. Um, hackers love Ethernet, so let's see where that goes. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I saw that you are um, laying the kernel versions which are in the system, so do they get updated on the lifetime of a car, or does it have the, mm. more or less all the software components from when the car mm. was designed? Um, this is going to change. So for um, vehicular reg no, for getting a type approval, car manufacturers now have to prove that they have some kind of update management. So if you build a car and you want to have it type registered in uh, UNECE, which is more or less whole of Europe, uh, South Africa, uh, South America, South Africa, Australia, and things like that, you have to have a concept at hand how you will be able to update the software. So it's not mandatory uh, to update the software. This is, of course, an economical question. Of course, it's cheaper to do it over internet or any other mean, um, but um, I'm not sure if it's obliged. You just have to demonstrate that you have an update concept. And this will get more and more. So everybody is attaching SIM cards to stuff like crazy. Um, we will get there that uh, a car will update itself overnight. Okay. Thank you. I've got one question myself. Mm. Uh, as a user of a modern car, mm. um, um, my eldest already told me earlier with my former car, uh, it's nice that you use that OBD uh, port, but take it out when you're not near the car because someone can hack into it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Mm -hmm knew more than I did. Uh, any other hints and tips for people what to do and what not to do with mm. your car? Good question. So every car is different. You should know at least the wireless things that are going on. Mm -hmm. uh, you should understand if you pair a new car key over Bluetooth uh, that at least you should verify that there's some code you have to enter, things like that. Um, you can understand the apps that you are using. So if you use an Android app, pipe it into one of those analyzing frameworks and see what they do, what requests they do. Um, besides that, nag the manufacturer. They, they have the, all the knowledge and documentation. Um, and also things like the German ADAC, they know how to secure things physically. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, there's one more, one more, one more. Yep, yeah. and, but yep, I'm going to ask for that applause, but one more question. Just one quick question. Um, so since there are now popping up a lot of small companies that build mm -hmm. electric cars because you need the, don't need that mechanical drive shaft and all that stuff anymore, mm -hmm. yeah, are you aware of any company that kind of tries to build a secure car, open concept-wise, maybe something like that? Because there's just all mm -hmm. the other stuff is going to end up like smartphones with bloatware and all yeah. the other shit, and I don't want that. Yeah, it, it's more or less about the time of market. So if a manufacturer is really keen on hitting time to market early, uh, they will take available components, plug them together, and not 
put much effort into changing them. Um, on the other side, if you have a robust background and uh, robust knowledge of a vehicle, chances are high that you have a concept for security and key management and things like that. Um, so I expect that new companies that make an electric vehicle, uh, they will do the same mistakes again and again, just like all the big ones did, um, but eventually we will get there. Every supplier will be required to do security, updatability, things like that. Uh, it will change. Yeah, it's more like, is there like an a offline per design thing that was like? Mm, I don't know any. Okay. <laughs> it's all about convenience and apps and, yeah. I, li I like that sentence, eventually we will get there. Mm -hmm. And I think let's keep it on that for today. Ladies and gentlemen, big hand again. <laughs>